All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our American History series uh, of webinars. My name is Paul. I am one of the instructors here at Penn Foster High School focusing on our social studies courses. A couple of quick ways of um, contacting us as we sort of get started here today. Know that myself, the rest of our educational team, um, we are available by, by phone as well as by email and chat uh, through the help and support page. So please, by all means, certainly use those resources as uh, you need them, as you need help. We also have, just like this one, uh, webinars as well as other live help available on the webinar schedule, as well as um, recorded webinars. So our three major, uh, our three objectives, looking at the different factors of native life before colonization, um, looking at the rise of, of power by, by uh, the English, and then outline the successes and failures of our new English colonies. So first of all, just thinking about the term American Indians, or I, I know growing up, I, I knew the term Native Americans. Um, so I'll, I'll be using kind of both of those terms uh, throughout the webinars and throughout our discussions uh, in, in the future webinars. But you know, th there's a lot there, there's a lot to that term, and in different parts of the American uh, colonies, these different groups meant different things, and it's hard to kind of combine them all into one category of, of Native Americans or American Indians because they were vastly different between the different tribes. Okay, so um, language has been the, the general form that we have been grouping different Native American tribes together. Um, but, but primarily, again, because of how different they are in so many other different ways. So there are significant cultural differences that we'll talk a little bit more about. Forms of farming and agriculture, um, as well as medicine, that in different parts of just the United States, but also in what is now Mexico, the rest of Central America, as well as South America, the vegetation, the herbs, the, the agricultural opportunities, all very different depending on which American tribe you're talking about and which region of the, of the, of the Americas you're talking about, as well as military-wise. Some tribes, um, notably in, in the Americas, the, the Apache or the um, Iroquois or in Central America and, and uh, South America, there were the Incas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, known for military, known, known for conquest. Uh, while other tribes, known far more for peace, known, known far more for being in their own areas and not worrying about possessions, not worrying about property. So we see a very large variety of these Native American tribes. That kind of goes back to, that'll bring us to our first poll question. So of all these different divisions that we know of for, for Native Americans, what is, what's the main way that we know how to group these Native American groups? Is it through their farming techniques? Is it through their language, their medicine, or their military strategies? So uh, two thirds of you absolutely correct that it is by language. Um, the farm. So the so the language is uh, again the different areas of the Americas, of South America, of Central America. They are th those pockets of civilizations and those tribes were speaking the same language. So that's why we sort of categorize them in that way. That the, that the different native tribes that you read about in your reading assignments, section one point one. And the ones that we'll talk a little bit more today as well, they are they are categorized not necessarily because we know that they were the same tribes, but because of the languages that they spoke. Farming is far more different between the different tribes um, because of where they were and and what was available to them. So the the first group that we'll talk about are the Azanis. They primarily lived in the southwest of what is the United States. Think of Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada. The first thing we think about is that that is a very dry area, very little rainfall, hot, humid area. And so they had to live based on that, that type of, of uh, environment. So they were looking for 
in terms of survival, in terms of food, their crops were those that were um, that could have a lot of uh, vegetation, a lot of growth with very low rain. Culturally, they had what's called kiavas, which were temples that were built underground. So there were pits that archaeologists found that they found based on writings, based on art that was found within not only the, the kiav itself, but also in the settlements, that these were their religious spots. These were their religious um, areas that they were, they came together to worship. We also found, even today, we find homes built by the Azazi that were built in cliffs and canyons. Again, think about the, 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 the ground there. Think about wh what that area looked like. And in order to survive, these people needed to be able to build their homes in mountains. If you learn more about in uh, world history, when we get into the South American tribes, you'll see the exact same thing with, with groups like the Incas, who lived in uh, what is now Peru and Argentina that lived within mountains. They too had these cliff dwellings these, these, uh, in, and in canyons that they were able to survive based on their, their environment. You know, today with, with all the different technologies that we have, we're able to live anywhere. You know, you can live in Arizona, New Mexico, Florida um, because of air conditioning, because you're just able to plop your, you know, a, a, a town, a city is able to grow anywhere. We're able to grow grass anywhere. So um, much different society now that you're able to just kind of put, put a house, put a neighborhood, put a city, basically wherever you want, back, back before colonization before the 1600s before the 1400s you're seeing these societies grow based on civilization this is one of the uh, groups of native american tribes that, that historians are not sure of why they demised they actually um, ceased to be a major civilization even before uh, colonization by the spanish in, in the region and we're and again we're just not sure as to why was it because of resources was it because of um, that that the crops were just not enough that they eventually just um, because of the heat because of the environment that they just weren't able to survive any longer was it because of warring tribes next to them that finally took them over these are all these are the kinds of questions that we're sure that we're still not sure of based on uh, archaeology based on artifacts that we're able to find the, these this is one of those ultimate questions much like the mines in, in, in Central America, we don't know why some of these civilizations ended up disappearing. Another tribe was the Algonquin, Algonquin tribe, which um, was in the, uh, on the East Coast in what's considered the Mid-Atlantic, which is Virginia, Maryland, DC, and Pennsylvania, as well as farther north into uh, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, the, the New England uh, states. They, again, are connected by a common language. And just like the Azazi were um, lived off of their conditions, so did, so did the Algonquin. If you live in this region, you know hunting is, is, is going to be something, a lot, a lot of different forests, a lot of uh, natural resources there, um, and a lot of areas to fish, a lot of areas to um, to find food. So this society was able to flourish in, in most part because of the richness of resources, that with forests, with um, areas to be able to farm, f with um, the ability to find water, water, water streams and, 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 and places to be able to uh, fish and to be able to, again, be able to grow societies based on being able to, again, feed themselves. The Algonquins were um, one of the Native American tribes that famously had communal land ownership. So when colonization arrived, um, particularly among Puritans, among um, uh, William Penn going into Pennsylvania, the big thing that the Algonquin tribe was, was shocked by and in communications with the, with the new English um, colonists was the idea of owned property, that, that whoever owns a certain land or certain um, property, that was theirs. This is something that was foreign to the Algonquin tribes, that a, a farming area was for the civilization, was for the tribe. What was found in hunting 
was given to the tribe. So this idea of communal uh, uh, communal ownership was something that was that uh, was part of the Algonquin uh, culture. Um, as I as I mentioned, the um, they ended up being next to the Puritans and other sort of more uh, very famous uh, colonies like like Pennsylvania, New York, um, and famously they were the ones who first helped the Puritans survive. Um, as part of the first Thanksgiving, um, but also began uh, ha had had their fights, um, and and sadly the um, war with the Padawan Confederacy of the Algonquin tribes was a, a, a famous part of English co colonization um, in the New England areas. Now, because the Quakers who moved into Pennsylvania um, along with William Penn, they are. Uh, they, Quakers are famously pacifists, are famously um, those who do not want to have war. So they actually had relative peace with the Algonquins um, in, in the early goings of the of the Pennsylvania colony. The next group is is the Iroquois, uh, very close to the Algonquins. They are in um, they are in what's called now uh, in Ontario and Canada, as well as northern New York. They are famously uh, considered the five tribes of the Iroquois, that they were um, warring tribes, um, but they are also known for their for their government. That within their society, within their five tribes, was a bicameral legislature that had um, groups that were or, or members of the of the legislature who would help choose laws, but uh, as as um, um, elders, uh, groups of elders. They had an unwritten constitution, so most of their rules were sort of passed down, but or, or uh, their former government was passed down by by speaking, and then they would create laws themselves between the chiefs and the uh, bicameral legislature. Uh, the the Iroquois are also famous for the French and Indian War between the United, between Great Britain and their colonists and the French and their colonists. The Iroquois were one group; both the British and the French wind on their sides, and the Iroquois ended up splitting during the French and Indian War because neither because some wanted to go with the French and some decided to go with the British. Women are famously have a strong role within Iroquois society. Um, the the men who marry into a, into a woman's family is actually the one who actually move in. Thinking about um, most European societies, it's really the other way around. That once a woman marries, she has become part of the of the husband's family. The reverse is true within Iroquois uh, society. Um, along with being war. The Iroquois are also a very agricultural society, um, so that was another aspect of their of their rise as a as a Native American power. Um, a very good question uh, was raised about uh, the the Iroquois name itself and what it means. Um, I have to actually double check on that because I don't r completely remember uh, that question. So I do apologize. I will try to get that information to you. Um, as uh, right after the presentation, but thank you, thank you very much for the question. So those are the Native American tribes, and now we'll move into um, across the, across the Atlantic, Great Britain, um, and 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 England itself, tr working towards taking its place on the world stage. Just as we start learning about, just as Europeans start learning about um, this new world of of what we now call the Americas, North and South America. Great Britain is on its way to try to become more of a world power. Up until this point, England is divided kingdoms. And we start seeing more and more powerful monarchs taking control of more and more of England. And the moment is really right for Great Britain to rise in terms of world power, just again as colonization is really taking form in the American colonies. They are growing in power in the 16th and 17th century. However, it's it's generally still very limited. Most mo most of Europe is still fighting amongst themselves, and they're still fighting amongst themselves from the collapse of the Roman Empire several centuries beforehand. So we're so Europe is still really kind of rearing, uh, reeling from the the uh, dissolving of the Roman Empire, and countries like Spain, France, Portugal. Portugal um, are, are really trying to gain their own power, 
Um, and far more successfully, they were able to do that before even Great Britain was. There was also a large amount of religious divisions. Um, this is the time of Henry VIII um, and his uh, rejection of, of the Catholic Church. So he was able to marry his, his uh, multiple wives and the creation of the Church of England. So there is a mass, there, there's a lot of fighting within England over the uh, the monarchy and their Church of England versus those of Catholic, uh, the Catholic faith. Um, it's not until Queen Elizabeth that we really start seeing a, a resolution uh, of the of the religious division, as well as a, a unification of the English of the English islands. And really, what helps is finding a common enemy, and it it ends up being the Spanish, and Queen Elizabeth and and future monarchs really see themselves that that they're not able to challenge the Spanish quite yet. The Spanish are really the the superpower of the of the 16th and 17th century, and particularly their naval power. So what was what was known as the Spanish Armada, um, what was the really the rulers of the of the sea uh, at the time. So uh, Philip of Spain, the, the the king of of Spain at that time, really tried to show his dominance through the, through the Armada, and Queen Elizabeth and 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 uh, future kings and queens know that they can't compete directly with this with the armada so they put together um, and, and sponsor groups of what's called english sea dogs uh captains uh affectionately considered essentially pirates uh for the time that they that the the, the english really wanted these sea dogs these pirate ships to weaken the spanish armada so they begin to go out and attack some of these uh spanish ships and eventually, in 1518, um, Philip has had enough, and he actually sends out his Spanish Armada to the to England to finally have out with the British and and, and destroy the the Sea Dogs, the, the the those those ships as well as the rest of the of the English uh, uh, country. Um, and they likely would have won. We would have seen a much different history if not for a very large storm that ended up destroying most of Philip's Spanish Armada and allowing the English to then rise themselves as a new power within, the, within not only Europe, but the rest of the world. With the destruction of Philip's Armada, this really begins the decline of Spain. Um, first as an international power, but then over the next several uh, 200 years, the, the loss of their colonization in the West. That starting now, starting with the, with the Armada destruction, we see the decline of Spain. And that leads us to our next poll question. In the 16th century, which country was had the most powerful military? Was it Great Britain, France, Spain, or Portugal? So uh, we do have a split between Great Britain and France. Um, the answer was Spain. So Spain had the Spanish Armada, had the, the greatest fleet, had the greatest empire uh, in, the, in the Americas. We really see, again, Spain kind of uh, at the pinnacle of its power. But just as Spain um, has that the, the huge storm, really probably hurricane that destroyed their armada, it's now becomes a British time to rise and, and they take a, uh, they try to take advantage of that. Um, really they, they try to take advantage of it and, and in some cases they are very successful, in some cases not not so much. Um, they continue to, uh, the, the British do, do uh, send out their sea dogs to, to continue to um, fight in New Spain, which is uh, what was now south, most of South America as well as Central America and Mexico. The New Spain region that was colonized um, over, the, over the previous century or so is now under the attack by uh, Francis Drake, by John Hopkins. And the two of them, particularly Drake, really gains prominence and really gains popularity among the English crown 
with his attacks against the against the Spanish. And he has actually provided knighthood by by the monarchy, um, showing just how how much he and others other other uh, sea dogs were really benefiting the British crown and and weakening Spain. The fir uh, the the first sort of movements into in, into um, into colonization happened by these sea dogs by by these uh, pirates. Um, one was Humphrey Gilbert, who became very popular uh, to the monarchy after he was uh, he he led the the um, putting down of of Irish rebellions, um, which is something that we see over the again. Really, up until about 50 years ago, there were still open questions of how of of by some uh, Irish citizens that they should not be part of Great Britain, and it all of a sudden uh, it, it already starts way back at this time, going again back to the um, Henry VIII wanting to uh, get divorced and remarry, um, breaking from the Catholic Church, and and much of I Ireland. Is predominantly Catholic, so these these divisions that we see even today or or the last several decades still are fostered by history, still fostered by the idea that cultural decisions and religious reasons that were or decisions that were made centuries ago are still influencing nations today. But Humphrey Gilbert, um, essentially getting praise for. Um, being able to put down the Irish rebel rebellion is among the first to be able to go settle in the New World. So he sells in Newfoundland, uh, e eastern Eastern Canada, and Sir Walter Riley, another famous uh, privateer or, or sea dog, goes to Roanoke um, as sort of a first venture into what we what we now consider as our third of uh, the thirteen original colonies and and the rest of the United States. Roanoke. Uh, which is now in Virginia. Um, he goes in 1585 and um, immediately starts losing supplies, start, start uh, uh, put, uh, not able to keep supplies, not able to use them effectively. And um, he really uh, ruins his case by ending up killing one of the American Indian chiefs and immediately has to leave. So his colonists, after killing the chief, Knowing that they were going to be slaughtered by the by the Indian tribes, leaves Roanoke. They they return two years later, um, stronger and trying to uh, resume their fights with the tribes. Raleigh actually gets injured during uh, during some of the wars and has to leave leave Roanoke um, for several years again. And when he returns, the settlement has vanished. So this is the lost colony of Roanoke. This is where that that idea comes from. That when when Raleigh and and his uh, and his new colonists return, again the settlement is vanished. They have no idea what happened. Um, most theories are that the that the uh, local uh, native tribes attacked them one more time. Um, and probably wiped out the colony, but we still have no idea. That is, that is again, another sort of historical mystery of exactly what happened to Roanoke. Was it Native Americans? Was it disease? Um, was it something else that was, you know, we, we, we just don't know. Was it just general starvation um, or just a, a, re, a, a lack of organization, lack of leadership that they weren't able to uh, remain as a colony? The Virginia colony is still one that that the uh, that the crown wants that the crown wants new colonies closer to where the British and the French um, have their own colonies. But the British know that's very expensive. That's so after this failure in Roanoke, they immediately think, okay, well we really still want uh, colonies, but how are we going to afford them? So this leads to. Uh, calling for private investment. And the first one that comes up is the uh, Virginia Virginia Company as a, as, a, as a colonial company. And these are called jo uh, joint stock companies. And they're the ones who start populating the, col uh, the early colonies for the British. And many of the new colonists were younger children of, of noblemen. 
um, in in English society when you know today when when uh, when adults get older they, and they start making wills they want to divide up their 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 wealth they want to divide up their resources so they start looking at their children they start looking at other uh, family members and you know decide how much you know each person gets or who gets what um, back in back in this time there was no division whoever the oldest male son gets everything and so for younger children of, of these noblemen who st you know have wealth but none of their own they look at the idea of a new colony and uh, they look at those as new wealth so they are interested in going to these colonies with with the virginia company and others um religious dissenters from the church of england think about um, our the puritans the quakers groups like that um other separatist religious societies um, decide to go to the colonies for again to be able to have their own religious um, uh, colonies and also low-skilled workers there are you know th this is sort of around the time of the first industrial age in great britain and many people have success in the in the in the industrial revolution many people don't and so we start seeing a lot of these low-skilled and low-wage workers who are still very poor and and still have very little in England deciding to go and uh, try try their hand in in colonial work so the first successful colony for the English was was Jamestown the Virginia Company originally um, colonized and, and sent colonists there looking for gold believing that that was going to be the best way to, to gain a lot of wealth in this new colony and to their detriment they they that's what their focus was they were only focused on uh, looking for gold very little attention towards farming and so within just a couple of years most of the Jamestown colonists were had died because of starvation and, and, and illnesses because they did not attend to basic survival as opposed to trying to get wealthy. John Smith was able to turn some of this uh, misfortune around um, by, by setting up homes, by setting up farming communities. Um, and but, but however, he had only limited success because eventually he did get injured um, and had to return to England. So he was not able to work towards Jamestown's success as much as he probably would have liked to. And the the fortunes of Jamestown really turned on the, the tobacco trade. At the time, the British knew that tobacco was a, a good resource and, and a good cash crop. Um, it had already come from Spain when trading with Native Americans in, in South and Central America. And the, the Jamestown uh, tobacco actually be, only began to grow into popularity because of cultivation, that, that some of the um, spices and some of the um, uh, work and fertilization that the, that the tribes or that the Jamestown used while working with the local tribes helped them grow better tobacco. And that tobacco would eventually lead to uh, popularity and, and, and gain towards wealth for the Virginia Company that led to an expansion of not only the tobacco trade but also the Virginia Virginia colonies. With the uh, growth of plantations within uh, Jamestown and the rest of Virginia Colony led to more indentured servants. So thinking back to the low-wage workers who weren't successful in England, they were then told by the Virginia Company, hey if you come and work for several years on plantations in Virginia, you not only will get there for free, but after several years, you'll be able to have your own land. You'll be able to have your own property. This was a big um, plus for a lot of these low-skilled workers to be able to go for minimum price, still work, and then be able to have your, their own property after several, several years. This is where we start seeing problems with the um, with the Algonquin tribe and the Panawan, uh, 
Powhatan, sorry, um, uh, chief, um, first supported the, helped support Jamestown, helped, like I said, the, the tobacco trade and, and, and farming, um, work with John Smith. However, he eventually um, turned on them and, and there was, um, or, or tur turned on the Algonquins, I should say, to be able to have, um, to be able, a, a, as the English were trying to gain more land and be able to gain more power within the Virginia colony. Eventually, what was called starving time, in which um, both Jamestown residents as well as natives um, began uh, having problems, being able uh, started started uh, uh, fearing for their lives. Um, Pohontan ends up marrying marrying off his daughter Pocahontas to John Rolfe as the leader of the Virginia as the leader of the Virginia and Jamestown colony. However, when she return, when she goes to England with him, she ends up dying not long after from English diseases. The chief and uh, decide to continue to fight um, after Pocahontas dies. However, they all, they ultimately fail, and um, the Iroquois, or I'm sorry, the Algonquin, end up losing more and more land to the Virginia Company. Last slide, as just a general summary of, of English go uh, government, English colonial power um, in the colonies. The king, the monarchy did have ultimate control. We, we learned about that probably in your US civics course. Also from your civics course, we, we know of the sort of the, the ultimate movement from power of the of the of the king as an absolute monarch first to the to the um to the nobles within the magna carta and then the english bill of rights expands even more rights not only to the nobles but also to the common citizens of england and today we have the parliament or or um, not today but but at the time of colonization we have the parliament uh, having most of the control over British society, and we have the copy of that in the Virginia in the Virginia colony with the House of Burgess as its representation as uh, as its representative government um, in the English colonies. Are there any questions? So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you again all for uh, your attendance and your attention. Thank you so much.